Welcome to Truth for Transformation. I am Timothy Brown, and I am delighted that you decided to study God's Word with us today. I want to encourage you to go and take your Bibles out. We are going to go through God's Word verse by verse today. And I also want to invite you to share this with your friends and family and like this page. We want to get God's Word out around the world, changing lives one life at a time. Let's prepare our hearts for God's Word. Father, we thank you that your Word is truth and that your Word has the power to change our lives. So Father, as we look into your Word, speak to our hearts and help this be a day where the truth changes our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. How am doing? So good to see so many smiling faces. That was a great time of worship, amen. Let's give the worship team another hand. Appreciate them. Something you don't know about Joe is this week was a very productive week for him. He not only did his normal duties, but he had a funeral this week, and he had a wedding in the same week. And everyone is like, Joe did such a good job, you should let him have more funerals and weddings. And I was like, all right, we'll let him keep him active. We want to welcome all of our guests. If you're new to Radiant, we want to say welcome home. I'm one of the pastors here. My name's Timothy, and I'd love to meet you after the service. We'll be down in the Radiant Resource Room just to say hello. We are in the Song of Solomon chapter 3, so go ahead and turn there. And as you turn there, let's prepare hearts in prayer. Father, we are grateful for your word. We are thankful that your word is true. Your word is everlasting. Jesus told us that heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of God will stand forever. So, Father, on those timeless truths we stand today, bless your word and bless our time together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to tell you a true love story about two people by the name of Jason and Heather. They basically were really, really good friends because they taught in the same school. They shared classrooms side by side, adjacent classrooms. They went to the same church, and they even taught in the same youth group. But there was one problem. They were just friends. And so Jason went on a mission trip for three months, And while he was gone, Heather could not resist these feelings that she began to feel for Jason. She began to feel love for him and just sense his passion and romance. The problem, Jason didn't feel the same way. So when he came back from his three-month mission trip, she didn't want to say anything. She didn't want their friendship to be affected, so she began to pray, Lord, if he's the one for me, then give him the same romantic feelings that I have for him. So the year went by. Then another year went by, she kept praying. And all of a sudden, Jason asked Heather that he wanted her to pray with him about a job possibility that he had been offered. So they did a three-day fast. And at the end of the three-day fast, he said, before we talk about my job, can we talk about us? And Heather was like, whoa, us? He said, I don't know why, but I feel like we'd be perfect together. The problem is I just don't have romantic feelings for you. I see you as a friend. See, the thing, Jason did not date anyone until he thought they would get married, and he had not had a girlfriend for seven years, so he just didn't see girls with romantic feelings unless he saw them in marriage. So Heather, she didn't know whether it was the Lord or her being crazy. She said, well, if you do get feelings, you might as well go ahead and propose because it's no different than where we're at now. We're so close, such good friends. So the phone hung up, and she's like, I don't know whether that was God or that was crazy, but I I laid it out there. So three and a half weeks later, after waiting two long years, it was her 25th birthday, and Jason got up on stage at their church, called his friend Heather on stage. It was her birthday, and he proposed in front of the entire church, and she said, yes. We all love love stories because love stories reminds us of our first love. Love stories, for those who are single, makes us dream and wonder, does God have something for me? So we've been going through this entire book of the Song of Solomon, and a little plug for Wednesday nights. If you miss Wednesday nights, you're missing the the really, really good stuff. I've saved some of the best content for Wednesday night, so just, just so you know. So Song of Solomon is about this true love story about Solomon and this lady that's not even named. She's called the Shulamite Woman. And we're not sure the full history, but I lean towards that this was Solomon's first true love. And he wrote this about the Shulamite woman. And we mentioned last week, she's not named, and we don't know why, but perhaps one possibility is for every true love, 
every woman that's in love, they can put their name in the story of what God wants for their life, an exciting romantic relationship. Now, there are those listening who have the gift of singleness, and that's a gift. Paul says, if you have the gift of singleness, embrace that. You can always look at your relationship with God as the perfect example. And so, for the rest of us who are in relationships or desire, I want to turn your attention to Song of Solomon 3. And before we read the Scripture, I just want you to read the grace note. We mentioned it last week because this has some content that the majority of us will simply be convicted of. Let's just be transparent. But because we're convicted of it doesn't mean we lower the standard. God's Word is always there. And as a society, we fall short of God's Word. So we have two options. One is a good one, one's not. One option is we change the standard to match our lifestyle, which is watering down the Word. The other standard is we come to the foot of the cross, receiving grace and mercy where we've fallen short, and we ask God to help us live according to His standard. And just so you know, at Radiant Church, we speak everything in a heart of love and compassion. And most of us, when we read scriptures, we're like, I've fallen short. But the gospel is God gives forgiveness and grace and many chances. So if, if you're in here today for the first time and you read the scripture and you're like, it's convicting, that's the Bible doing its work. The Bible has a very impactful, it's like a sword that divides our thoughts and our feelings and helps us realize that we need the grace of God. Amen. So today's message I've entitled In Search of True Love, Discovering Your Heart's Desire. So I want you to look at Song of Solomon 3, and I want to give you a few points about what true love really looks like. So let's look at Song of Solomon 3. We're going to read the verse three verses, and then I'll give you the first point. All night long on my bed, I looked for the one my heart loves. I looked for him but did not find him. I will get up now and go about the city through its streets and squares. I will search for the one my heart loves. So I looked for him but did not find him. The watchmen found me as they made their rounds in the city. Have you seen the one my heart loves? So today I want to give you four truths about true love. The first one is this, finding true love and lasting love requires dedication and determination. It requires dedication and determination. We see in Song of Solomon chapter 3, the Shulamite woman. She is having a dream sequence, which means that she's so in love with Solomon. At nighttime, she is dreaming about him and her mind takes her to where is he? And in her dream sequence, she can't find him. She searches for him through the city. She goes everywhere on a search of her one true love, but he's nowhere to be seen. I believe that her dream sequence can teach us a lot about true and lasting love. And if you're single or if you're single again, desire to have a relationship, I would pay attention to this. A lot of applications we can draw. The first one is keep on looking. A lot of times when we don't find true love, we give up. Women will say something like this, there are no good guys out there. I've tried many, they're, they're just horrible. And men will say, you know what, all the ladies are just, I, I, they're just not good. And I just want to say out of the 8.1 billion people on planet earth, is it not possible there is someone for you? So I think that maybe sometimes we limit what is out there because we stop searching the other thing is don't give up when you don't initially find true and lasting love. Some of you who are single have been on dates. Some of you have been through relationships, and some have been through divorce, and that's heartbreaking. And we don't minimize those experiences. We enter into that pain and say that God still has a, a plan and purpose for you. Even if you've had bad experiences, it does not mean that there's true and lasting love that's out there. You must be willing to take great risks for the possibility of great love. If you notice the Shulamite woman in her dream sequence, she goes in the city at nighttime. And just so you know, in any city back in the day, it was dangerous at nighttime. The, the advisory was do not go out at night. So she was in the city searching for him. And that's symbolic that if you want to find true and lasting love, you have to sometimes take a risk. It's a risk to open up your heart to someone. Don't be afraid to ask others for help. 
Notice in verses 1 through 3, when she can't find her love, who does she talk to? The watchman. She's like, have you found the one my heart loves? And we see the watchman in later chapters. So don't be afraid to ask for help. Because love should not be just you and another person. It should be a community giving you advice, giving you input, and helping you as you guard your heart. And it's believing that God rewards those who actively seek Him in faith. In Hebrews eleven six, it says, faith is believing that God exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. So this brings up a big question that Christian singles ask. Christian leaders and counselors, what about Christian dating apps? Anybody ever been asked that question? Is it okay? Should we? Should we not? And so the Bible is not laid out like a concordance where you could just turn and it say uh, eHarmony, thou shalt, thou shalt not, or uh, a rated R movie. Thou, it's not laid out that way. And one of the reasons why is Jesus said he would send you the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit would guide you. The Bible talks about the church community and the multitude of counselors, their safety. So I can't give you a yes or no, but I can give you some wise counsel. If you're a Christian single and you desire to be married one day, start off with prayer. Ask God, would you want me to go on a Christian dating app? If you feel a check in your spirit, you got to stop and pause if God just has this red flag. If you have peace about it, I'm going to tell you a step that most people will not tell you is a symbol of team of people that you trust that have similar Christian convictions and let them be your group that vets potential candidates. You notice I say candidates, you're testing it, okay? This may be people in your family, it may be people in your small group, because what happens as you've heard the saying, love is blind, when we use that phrase, we're talking about not love, but infatuation in the feelings. I've, I've seen many people that go on dating apps, sometimes it works out really good, but some people have horrible experiences and sometimes compromise is because you need that group of accountability. So if you go forward, get you an accountability group to say, no, honey, that he's not a good guy. I've looked at his Facebook. Have you seen every other post as him getting drunk? I wouldn't, you know, you need that feedback for accountability. So there's, there's a few cautionary things for singles. Right now, if you're still working on your relationship with God and it's struggling, you don't need to add anyone to the mix. So work on your walk with God first before you seek to add someone else to the mix because it complicates things if you and God are struggling in your walk. Uh, The second thing is that if you're a man and you're struggling financially, I would encourage you to work on your finances first before you seek a bride because you're called to be the provider. So if you're living in mama's basement, it may be the call to, all right, maybe I need to get another job. Just throwing that out there. So it brings a question, how does this point us to Jesus? As I mentioned in week one, this is a literal story about a husband and a wife, Solomon and the Shulamite woman, but there are spiritual applications that we can draw because marriage is simply a picture of Christ's love for the church. Pastor Kevin did a great message from Ephesians 5. So a godly marriage will mirror Christ's love for the church. So it brings the question, what does this point us to Jesus? If you notice that your relationship with God, it's not static, it's dynamic. And the Bible says that God wants to be found by you. So I want you to write this scripture down. It comes from the prophet Jeremiah. When we think about God wanting us to seek him, it's the prophet Jeremiah And he says this in Jeremiah 29, 13, if you're taking notes, you shall seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart, Jeremiah 29, 13. In James 4, 8, it says it like this, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So this has brought many Bible readers through the centuries. This book, by the way, is about 3,000 years old. People go through something called the dark night of the soul. What is the dark night of the soul? It's those times where God seems distant. It's those times when you pray and your prayers seem to hit the ceiling. It's the times where you can't feel God in your life. So what we draw from this passage is that you should have the Shulamite woman's approach. You keep seeking, you keep searching until you have that connection again. So don't give up. Keep pursuing God no matter what. The second truth about true love is once you find true and lasting love, tenaciously hold on to this priceless gift. Look at verse 4. 
the woman has continued to speak as she's searching through the city. Scarcely had I passed them when I found the one my heart loves. I held him and would not let him go till I brought him to my mother's house to the room of the one who conceived me. So we see the Shulamite woman found the one her heart loves. She was searching through the city and she's like, I found him. And I want you to notice the verbs. Look back in verse four, the verb tense. She held on to him. She would not let him go. And there's the bizarre phrase about, I wanted to bring him to my mom's house, into the room of the one who conceived me. And American mind, you're like, what? I mean, so we have to, this is dangerous for guys, but we have to get into the female brain a little bit. Many women desire the security in a relationship. So whenever a woman takes a guy to mom's house, it usually means the relationship is what? It's serious, right? So whenever she's like, I want to take him back to mom's house, she is calling forth the desire for security and comfort, a relationship that's so secure it will endure. So that brings us to an SOS insight. If you'll look on the screen, a Song of Solomon insight, most women desire both safety and security in a relationship. A godly man is called to provide both of these, safety and security. And men are called not to be passive, but to be active leaders. So here's the thing. If you know someone that's been in a dating relationship for eight years, and they're like, well, we're going to get married one day, that is a red flag. Because a relationship should move forward towards marriage. So if you know somebody that's been dating eight, ten years, the guy will never propose, send them this message, but don't send them my email, okay? <laughs> I don't want to respond to it. So men are called to lead by example. So I just want to say at Radiant Church, I can't speak for any other church, but at this church, the elders and the leadership, the staff, we don't set the bar low for men. We set the bar high for men. Because men need to be challenged. Men need to rise up and step up and to lead their families and their households. The culture sets the bar so low for men that they trip over it. If you look at society, if you look at TV, many men are like perceived as doofuses and they don't know what's going on. And all of a sudden the mom has to take over because the guys are sitting there on the remote watching TV. That's not the biblical picture of a godly leader that's leading his household. So men, it's time to man up. It's time to lead your families. And all the godly women said, amen. Yes. So that brings us to our third truth. What does it look like to pursue true love from Scripture? True and lasting love is holy, so make every effort to protect the purity of your relationship. So verse 5, if you remember, this same verse was in last week in chapter 2, so it's repeated again. So whenever something's repeated in Scripture, it means that you should listen to it. Why should you listen? Many people ignore it. So when something's repeated in Scripture, it's the author's way, it's the Holy Spirit's way of saying, okay, this is important. A lot of you may spurn the advice, but this is God's counsel. Look at verse 5. Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and the does of the field. Do not awaken love until it so desires. So we see the Shulamite woman, she is in this courtship with Solomon, and she cannot be, wait to be one in all areas with her husband. She is desiring him, and all of a sudden, every time her sexual desire is aroused, where she wants to go further than she should, there's this warning. Go back in chapter 2, the same warning. What is the warning? God has created this beautiful gift of sex. He's the designer. He's the creator. It's like fire in the fireplace. Fire in the fireplace is good. It brings heat, it brings warmth, it brings ambiance to the home. But if you let fire get outside of the fireplace, what happens? Fire on the carpet is a destructive blaze. So the same is true about sex. Many people will be like, I'm gonna do it my way. I don't care what God says. Listen, who created sex? God did, right? So if you want the fulfillment that God has for you, do it his way. Because what happens, we talked about this last week. If you missed the message, please watch last week. The way God made intimacy is when husband and wife come together, they're one flesh. So if you do that outside of marriage, you're one flesh with multiple people. So every relationship you enter, a piece of you has been torn away. And sometimes 
young ladies will end up in a relationship they should not be in, but they've already become one flesh, and it's hard to break away. So here's the grace note. This is not directed at anyone personally, even though it feels personal. And if you haven't done it God's way, there's the gospel, there's the good news that you have the chance to start today. So the the beautiful thing is God offers forgiveness, He offers grace, and when you add thought life in it, 100% of us have fallen short, right? Jesus said if you even look at another person lustfully, it's like committing the act. So when we view that standard, all of us woefully fall short, but then there's the grace of God, amen? So as I, as, I, as I talk about this passage, and some of you feel conviction of the heart, let the Holy Spirit work in your heart. Let us come alongside you as a church. Talk to one of our leaders. One of the stories I mentioned on Wednesday night that really was a hope-giving story to the audience was that there was this couple in another church that moved up from Florida, and they were living together, and they realized, hey, we shouldn't live together. We know we feel convicted. So I said, you know what, why don't, why don't you guys make a new commitment of purity that until you say I do, you guys won't be intimate. And they made the commitment. I did the wedding shortly thereafter because, you know, it was really difficult for them to stay pure. But that was a grace story. So we have stories like that, that no matter what your past is, there's, there's the grace of God. Amen. So in my study, I did some research. And so this will help you. you. You'll have people in your families, and I'm not saying you push this on them, but if they ask for counsel, if they're willing to ask for advice, this will give you some information to talk them through. I want to give you the seven reasons why people disagree with this. Whenever you, you give a biblical truth, the world will push back. Even some Christians will push back. But here's the thing. This is God's truth, and God's truth doesn't change. If a church changes its position on a moral issue, God hasn't changed, it's that church has changed. When it comes to truth, I want you to write this down, if it's new, it ain't true. If all of a sudden, oh, we've discovered this new insight and this is a new truth, if it's new, it's not true. It's bad grammar but great theology. Truth does not change, amen? Cultures change, societies change, but God's word remains forever. So I want to give you seven reasons, and this is all spoken in grace and in love. So if you fit this category and you're convicted, just know there's forgiveness at the foot of the cross. The first reason people give is everybody is doing it. How many of you have ever heard that reason? Everyone's doing it. Is that a valid reason for doing it just because everyone's doing it? Romans 12, 2 says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. Don't be conformed to the world. Instead, be transformed. Jesus said that we're to be like salt and light. So if you're just like the world, how are you being any different from the world? How is your light shining if you're just like everybody else? Reason number two, this is big. You'll hear this all throughout America. We're in a committed relationship, so it's okay. Now, commitment is good, but commitment is not marriage. In God's eyes, the only commitment that counts concerning intimacy is a covenant before God. Amen? So someone can say, well, we're, we're, we're committed. No. Listen to Hebrews 13, 4. This is a verse you often do not hear in church. It says, marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. In other words, God celebrates intimacy in marriage. It's like a blessing. But look at the f- next phrase. But fornicators and adulterers God will judge. This, this shows you how serious sex before marriage is. God doesn't look at it lightly. He doesn't just say, it's okay. He's like, listen, I, the, the reason why this is so personal, it's a reflection of God's love for the church. So it, it, does your relationship reflect God's love for the church? If not, this is an invitation for it to start. Number three, we've been living together for a long time, so it's practically marriage. That's a big reason people give. They call it legal marriage or legal law. So cohabitation doesn't equal marriage. How do I know that? Turn to John 4. Jesus meets this woman at the well, and he said, go call your husband. And what did she say? Well, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said, you're right. You've had five husbands, and the guy you're shacked up with, cohabitating with, he's not your husband. So Jesus clearly recognizes the difference between living together and marriage. Number four, I've heard this, we're planning to get married eventually. So what's the response to that? Well, until you're married, you're not married. So just because you have good plans, it doesn't set the same standard as what God has. Proverbs 16, 9, it says, A man's heart plans his way, 
but the Lord directs his steps. Number five, this is big in Asheville. For those of you outside of Asheville, you may not hear this as much, but we love each other, that's what matters, right? How many of you have heard that? We love each other, love is love. Let's use a little logic first of all. You can't define a word by the word. That's like saying dog is dog, blue is blue. (laughs) Who defines what love is? God defines what love is. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, that love is holy. So if what you're doing is not holy, you can call it a lot of things, but please don't call it love. God's love is holy. It's separate. And Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. There are many Christians who will claim love for Jesus, but the test is this, are you following his commandments? If you're not, Please don't claim that you love and follow Jesus because Jesus said, if you love me, you'll do what? You'll keep my commandments. Number six, it feels right to us. So if you followed your feelings, where would that get you in life? You would have to quit your job like every other day. You wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. Your feelings cannot be trusted. So whoever came up with the phrase, follow your heart, they didn't read Jeremiah the prophet who said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So in other words, the heart apart from God, don't follow your old heart. Unless your heart has been regenerate and you're following the Holy Spirit, that's different. All right, number seven, a little backdrop of this one. I used to be a singles pastor in Texas and I would, this was like one of the big excuses. I've already been married before. So divorcees would say, hey, I've already been married, so it doesn't matter if I'm living with someone, doesn't matter if I'm you know, intimate because I've already done it. So does your experiences change God's standards? So think about that. You're basically saying, based upon my present and past experiences, the Bible changes to meet what I've done or haven't done. Listen, truth is truth. So if you've been divorced and you're now single, follow God's standards God's way. It doesn't matter how many times you've been married. It's are you willing to do God's will right now? Amen? So here's the thing. As we read this, this is very convicting to our culture. And probably majority of us would say at some point we've fallen short. And it's not meant to bring guilt or condemnation, but it's meant to bring direction for your life. So if I was single and if I had messed up in the past, I would hear this message and I pray that my prayer would be from this day forward, even though I've messed up a thousand times, I'm going to do it God's way going forward. It's called being a spiritual virgin. And if you've been married and divorced, regardless of the circumstances, It's saying, from this day forward, if God sends me someone else, I'm going to do it God's way. And all God's people said, amen. All right, let's get off the hot seat. You're like, all right, you can breathe now. (laughs) And I'm not trying to step on anyone's toes. I'm just giving you the word. All right. The fourth truth about true and lasting love is true and lasting love progresses towards a lifelong commitment of holy marriage. So in verses 6 through 11, this dream sequence shifts to King Solomon coming to get her to be his bride. And so what I want to say is that if you're dating, gentlemen, if you're dating a young lady, I'm not saying there's a certain time limit, but it has to have a progression. It has to be like, okay, this is leading somewhere. Unless you have the gift of singleness, that's the exception. There are some people that are lifelong friends. But my, my, my cautionary is don't lead a young woman astray or who, however age, let it be heading somewhere. Let me show you in the text this dream, and it, it comes up into a wedding. Who is this coming up from the wilderness like a column of smoke, perfer- perfumed with myrrh and incense, made from all the spices of the merchant? Look, it's Solomon's carriage. So what this is, this is the wedding procession. He is coming to get his bride. And all of a sudden, notice the next verse. It says, escorted by 60 warriors. You know, I had a best man at my wedding and a few groomsmen. Solomon had 60. (laughs) Talk about a royal entourage. It says, all of them experienced in battle, each with his sword at his side, prepared for the terrors of the night. King Solomon made for himself the carriage. He made it of wood from Lebanon. For those of you who don't know what wood from Lebanon, that's like the best quality wood at that time. Very expensive Posts made of silver, base of gold. Its seat was upholstered with purple. I kind of visualized that purple velvet, you know, whatever it was back then. Beautiful interior. Little side note, isn't it interesting how men of all time have loved to impress women with their vehicles? You ever notice that? (laughs) Look at my car. 
I never had that opportunity. I always drove junkers until recently, so I never could experience it. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. Impress her. And notice the next phrase, it's interior inlaid with love. How many of you ever bought something and it said made with love? It's plagiarized off Song of Solomon, right? <laughs> it's, it's right here, made with love. Daughters of Jerusalem, come out and look, you daughters of Zion. Look at King Solomon wearing a crown, the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding. The day his heart rejoice. So this is a beautiful picture. Solomon comes to get his bride. In this day and time, most of the marriages were prearranged marriages by the parents. Solomon was the exception because he was the king. He could basically have his pick of anyone. They'd have to say yes or no. So of all the women in the known world that he had access to meeting, he picked this small town girl from a village near the mountains of Lebanon. I mean, think about it. He, he, he didn't pick the city girls, all elegant. He picked a small town girl with chapter one. She had a farmer's tan, okay? Of all the women, he's like, this is my one true love. So if you look on your listening guide, I want to give you the five or actually six stages of Jewish weddings. And this is significant because keep in mind, Jesus, we're, we're the bride of Christ. There's going to have some spiritual significance. But let's look at what happened. First of all, there was the wedding contract. What would happen is that there would be an agreement between the bride-to-be's father and the son. And there would be this contract of here's what the marriage would look like. And the son would pay a bridal price. Obviously, the father could help with that. They would pay this bridal price. And basically, there would be this commitment. And so what would happen is the son would go back to his father's house and prepare the bridal chamber, the place that they would live together. It's quite fascinating. If you look at John 14, Jesus said, I'm going away, but I'll come back for you. In my father's house, there's many dwelling places. What is he saying? He's using Jewish bridal language. I'm coming back. I'm preparing a house for you. The bride, stage two, would, the bridegroom would get his bride. So the wife-to-be would not know the time. But what would happen is when the, the room was finished, the dwelling place was finished, the father would approve it, and then the father would be like, go get your bride. So all of a sudden, the husband-to-be would take some friends and as they approach where the bride lived, whatever town or village, they would blow a shofar, a horn, and it would announce the bride to come out. It usually was a time unexpected, often in the evening or later in the day. And that's symbolic in Thessalonians where the trumpet is blown, the rapture, we were, we're called up to be with the Lord in the air. Jewish language here again. And then stage three, the wedding ceremony. There would be a formal wedding ceremony, vows exchanged, blessings exchanged. And then step four would be the honeymoon in the wedding chamber. They would go and consummate their marriage. A little preview for Wednesday night. We're going to be in the Radiant Cafe. We're going to talk about this. It would be hard to deliver on a Sunday morning. So chapter four is Wednesday night at six in the cafe. Uh, make plans to attend if you don't have plans. So they would consummate their marriage and then they would come out. And there would be a party often lasting seven days. So go back to Revelation. How long does the tribulation last? Seven years. What's going on during the tribulation? We're going to be having this marriage supper, feast, party in heaven for seven years. So you see it's the stages of the Jewish wedding match what's laid out in the New Testament for the church. And then step six is they share their new home and new life together. So after the seven years in heaven... You guys remember, there's a thousand-year millennial reign, and then there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. The new city is going to descend out of heaven onto earth, and so we will be with the Lord forever. So you see the picture of why it's important that Jesus lays out this picture in the Bible, Old and New Testament, that marriage is a greater symbol of the reality as Christians, that we are Christ, we belong to Him and one day we will be with him forever. And all God's people said, amen. So before we close out, there's a few things we can learn from Solomon. We see the attention. It's funny, in American culture, what is the attention on in an American wedding? It's on the bride, right, coming down the aisle. In the Jewish culture, who's the attention on right now, initially? Solomon, right? And you're like, why is the attention on the dude? It's a different culture. So Solomon is bringing his entourage 
But what can we learn? Notice the woman feels protected. Solomon has 60 armed warriors who are battle tested. So she feels protected. Solomon's like, I'm going to send my troops to make sure she is protected. She also feels provided for. Notice that he has made all the provisions. I love this wedding carriage made of Lebanon wood. Its posts are made of silver, purple upholstery made with love by Solomon. And she also feels privileged. Notice Solomon is wearing this crown. And you're like, I never had a crown at my wedding. Well, the idea is the, the wife should feel so honored and vice versa. Both should feel, I can't believe I'm marrying this man. I can't believe I'm marrying this woman. Both should feel that mutual reciprocity of that, man, I am so blessed. I am so blessed. Proverbs 18.22 says it like this. The man who finds a wife finds a treasure. So men, if you are married, treasure that bride. She is a treasure from the Lord. Amen. So I want to give you one SOS principle before we close. How do we apply this scripture? What insights does it give? A godly husband helps his wife feel safe and secure by protecting her from all harm, providing for all of his wife's needs, and loving his wife in such a way that she feels like the queen of his court. She feels privileged to be married to a man like this because he loves her sacrificially, he loves her publicly, and he loves her so uniquely. And where does this point us to Jesus? Jesus gave his entire life for us. The Bible says that even though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that through his poverty you might become rich. What does that mean? When we married Jesus, everything changed. Spiritually, we had eternal life. But one day and forever, we're going to be with him in a place where streets are made of gold, in a place where there's no more heartbreak. And I'm sorry for all of you. Many of us have experienced heartbreak with divorce and abandonment. We don't minimize it. That's painful. But I want you to know that Jesus will never leave you. Jesus will never forsake you. He's the lover that's always faithful. Amen. So we talked about four truths just in a brief review. Finding true and lasting love requires dedication and determination. So if you're single and you desire to be married, don't give up. Keep praying. Keep seeking after God and watch what he will do. Number two, once you find true and lasting love, tenaciously hold on to this priceless gift. Notice a Shulamite woman, once she found Solomon, she held on to him. She would not let him go. So husband, continue to pursue your wife. Wife, continue to respect and just, just have this marriage that other people see it and they're like wild by it. Not that you have a perfect marriage, but you have a passionate marriage. You have a marriage full of purpose. Number three, since true and lasting love is holy, make every effort to protect the purity of your relationship. Sex is not just sex. It's intimacy. It's not just physical. It's mind, it's body, and it's soul. That's why it's reserved for marriage. And when husband and wife come together, it's the idea of God's blessing and favor. So save that for the, the covenant of marriage. And true and lasting love progresses towards a lifelong commitment of marriage. In verses 6 to 11, we see them finally getting married. So let's summarize this into one big idea. What does finding true and lasting love look like? Finding true love will require a pursuit of dedication, commitment, and purity that leads towards a life of love together for the rest of your lives. So how do we apply it? Whether we're single, whether we're married, whether you're in your 80s and you have no desire to get married again, what application does it have? First of all, dedicate yourself to the pursuit of true and lasting love. So if you have no desire to get married, love the people in your life. Love the brothers and sisters that God has placed. Be a blessing. For those of you who do want to be married, pursue this. Love is unconditional, so don't have conditions set upon love and marriage. Cherish the priceless gift of love and don't become complacent. You know, it's so sad after a husband and wife's been married many years, they're like, oh, that old woman or that old man, don't go there, right? Don't let complacency enter into your marriage. Be excited when they walk through the door. Even if you've been married 60 years, be excited. Let every day be like the first day you've met. And finally, singles, prioritize purity and honor God's design for your relationship. 
safeguarding the sanctity of intimacy for marriage. You will not regret it. You will not regret saving intimacy for marriage, but you will regret it if you do it your way. You will. And I say this as a pastor who loves you, that has no condemnation, but God's got a better picture for you. And and even if you've messed up in the past, today's the day to take it to the foot of the cross and say, God, from this day forward, I'm going to do it your way. Because I realize it's not just intimacy, it's a picture of God's love for us. And that picture needs to be a pure picture. Amen? Let us pray. Father, we know that your word is like a sword. Sometimes it, sometimes it hurts, and, but we know ultimately it's meant to heal. So Father, we thank you that the word of God does not change even though cultures change. God, I pray that we would be faithful and we would be true to you no matter what. In Jesus' name and all God's children said, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today for Truth for Transformation. My prayer is that God's Word resonates deep within your soul. My mission here at this ministry is to encourage and equip and empower you to reach your full God-given redemptive potential. If you would like to partner with this ministry, you can do so by going to our church website. That is radiant828.com. Our mission here is to get the good news of Jesus Christ all around the world in its various formats. We want to do this through preaching. We want to do this through writing books that are going to encourage people. And we want to do this through radio and television. So your partnership helps us to reach more lives. We hope that this was a blessing and we hope to see you next week.